Hello and welcome to this, the second episode of Making a Game. I've actually renamed it, if you've seen from the title, I've renamed it to Making an Assembly Programming Game. So now that we've talked through some of our initial ideas, I think I have a really good understanding about what I'm trying to build. So I think it's poignant that we, we rename it nice and quick. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be building an assembly programming game. And you can see on the screen in front of me, this is where we got up to last time. Uh, this is a little bit broken, but uh, we'll be doing some fixes today. Uh, hey Matt, um, we'll be doing some fixes today and just making some changes. I'm going to be doing a, a fair bit of talking just at the very start. Um, hey Luke, uh, thanks for joining. In fact, I'm just going to log into YouTube and set an admin. just so that if anyone joins and posts spam, I don't have to uh, jump straight on it. Awesome, so this is where we got up to last week. So we're building a game called Automaton. Um, if you need some more context, you can check out the playlist. Hey Alex, hey Bedford. Um, so what what is this? Where, where did we get up to? So we've got a grid. We're rendering a grid using something called P5.js, which is a JavaScript processing library. We've got some walls that are defined in the code base. And we've also created this automaton. And if I click, I can create a new automaton. And you'll see this becomes the active automaton. Um, the registers are broken because we actually renamed these at the end of last episode. So making some changes to this is going to be sort of the first thing we do. But if you remember, we we basically set it up so that I could do some assembly programming. Click assemble. When it assembles, it stores it in this automaton. If we click on the uh, other automaton, sorry, it's not automatron, that's the name of the, the old game. Uh, if I click on this new automaton, I activate this one. You can see we don't have any assembly code in there. If I click back on this one, it's stored the code that I wrote. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is talking a little bit about architecture. I've spent quite a lot of time working through the architecture of this this week and, and just thinking about how I want this to work. And then we're also going to maybe look at building a basic assembler. So we'll be maybe reconnecting up these registers, maybe forget about these for now. Um, but let's make a start actually talking about how this is going to work. From a, from a hardware perspective, what I wanted to do was think if this was going to be a real machine, if we were going to physically build this like, like a Roomba robot, like one of those vacuum cleaners that can move around your house, what would it need like what's what's the cpu and all the supporting data structures going to need to look like so i've gone one step further than last week i've actually attached my ipad up this week um got a brand new ipad so that i can stream it so i've been doing some work in this automaton project just a bit of concept art you can see on the right there but the main thing i've been working on is this architecture document now we left off last week talking about some registers and this is where I was at last week when I was thinking about this. I'd sort of come up with this idea of having uh, some combination registers. So we had um, our AF register, our BC register, our DE register, our HL register and the PC, the program counter. And I was thinking about having these 4-bit registers that combine to 8-bit registers and then having a um, an 8-bit memory bus which would give us 256 memory locations and I was thinking about having four bit four bit um, data at each of the addresses and what I was going to do was I actually removed so last week we were talking about having I think I've got it in the code base uh, if we open up our objects.js um, we had this uh, S and I register. Now the S register was going to be like a sensor register and this was going to essentially give us information about the world around the robot. Is there a wall to the right of me? Is there a wall to the left of me? And then we had the I register which was going to be the input register. And what we were going to do with the input register was use, use this to basically write like if we wrote a 1 to the first bit then that would mean turn the motors on, move up. If we wrote it high to the second bit, then turn the motors on and go down. So we were thinking about 
actually interacting with the with the world around this robot around this automaton um or was it the io either way i can't actually remember which ones it was i've scrapped a lot of this basically um th these registers are gone what i wanted to do instead was i've created this memory map so if we've got 256 memory locations I was thinking we could have the first 240 memory locations, aka hash 00, zero to hash EF, as user defined memory locations, aka RAM, right? The user can do what they want, want with them. And then I wanted to have this reserved memory from F0 to FF, so the last 16 memory locations. And the reserved memory table that I was originally working with, this has changed a few times. But basically, I wanted that movement control and the proximity sensor to go in here instead. And the reason I wanted to do that was, well, it just made sense, basically. Why, why wouldn't we? Why would we memory map these instead? You'd never see, for example, on a game bot, you wouldn't have a register that represented the input output values of the buttons. So why would we do the same here? No, it doesn't make sense from a hardware perspective. And then as I kept working on this, I was toying quite a lot with the idea of going with a risk reduced instruction set versus a CISC complex instruction set last week. I've ended up going for a risk instruction set. I'm not going to talk through all the reasons I've done that. But one of the comp one of the issues that created for me was I wasn't sure what to do with the registers. Because, for example, if we had... Um, an instruction such as um, like store STAF0. So if we have an instruction like this, STAF0, then that is all we can do. We can only store the opcode and the operand. And if the operand is 8 bits and our memory bus is 8 bits, then I've got no way to specify when we're loading in and out of registers instead. So to get around that problem, all I've done is memory map to the registers. And I've said that if you did, for example, LDA F8, this wouldn't actually load from a memory location. This would load from the B register. And if you did STA F8, that would store to the B register. So say we wanted to load the value held at 0, 1, memory location 0, 1. We would do LDA 0, 1, STA F8. And what that would do is it would load the value at 0, 1 into the accumulator, into the A register. The, the A register is implicit, so I've not memory mapped it. And then when we said STA F8, we would store that in this memory mapped register. Now, Luke, who's in the chat, um, very good friend of mine, electrical engineer, I've spoken to a bit about this. He, he designed his own CPU, um, his own, well, his own computer for his dissertation. And I asked him, does this make sense? And he went, I don't know. So uh, we're going to try it. And what I've also done is I thought, well, we can set up indirect addressing here as well. Because if we've got the HL register, then that would mean we wanted to load into the HL register. But say we wanted to write, say we wanted to like store a location in the HL register and then write A to it, we could do that by saying STAFD. I don't know how useful this is, but I wanted to put in direct addressing in. And then the last thing I've added to this memory map is a timer. So the basic idea is in the timer, you've got eight bits, you can write up to 256 in there, well, 255. And then every clock cycle, it will count down and it will tick down until such time that you reach zero at which point the timer interrupt routine address will trigger and it will go to this location and call the subroutine there the interrupt service routine that is specified at that route at that address so for example if my interrupt routine address was at c0 i would just write c0 into ff and then when this timer finished, it would trigger C0. So if I wanted to use a timer, that's how I'd do it. There's only one timer. I mean, I could add 
multiple timers, I suppose. I don't really know what to do with these other three, four, five. Uh, these other five locations. So if anyone's got any ideas, in fact, one of them I was thinking, um, would it would it be cool if we could maybe do some painting? So we've got this white grid. Could we paint where the automaton is? Where the automaton is? Could I say um, put a one in the high bit? That means paint on your next tick cycle, and then pass in. Well, we'd have seven bits for the color. Um, I don't know if we'd need a seven bit color depth, but I was thinking maybe we could do some painting and then maybe we could also have some like ex other controls like, um, I don't know, we could like have a pen. We could think about the painting as like a pen, like imagine a turtle robot with a pen on it. Um, could we have like a claw to pick stuff up, like pick parcels up, put them down? That's sort of what the original Automaton, Automatron game was about, was about moving these packages around. So could we do something similar with that? I think that a lot of these gameplay mechanics are going to sort of emerge as as we as we actually build it. But yeah, so here's where I'm at with the memory map. Um, this is how the movement control register will work. So the movement control register is eight bits. We've got two bits specified for each of our directions. The first bit denotes whether the automaton should move in that direction, aka could you paint a trail that also disappears like a trace effect? Oh, that's... Yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. So we could, yeah, we could maybe have some sort of like temporary paint and maybe we could denote four bits that specify how long it lasts there. Yeah, I like that. We could we could maybe do something with that. Um, but yeah, so the first bit denotes where the automaton should move in that direction. So basically, if we put a one in this memory location here, that would say to the automaton on your next clock cycle, move left. And then it would write a zero back to here. If we wanted to say keep moving until you run into something, then we'd write one one because the second bit would mean uh, the second bit would be. Uh, I've just seen someone putting stuff in the chat. Put user in timeout. Hide user on this chat. There we go. Um, so the second bit would say if you have a one in this left hand location. Then there's also a one in this one that would say keep moving to the left every clock cycle until your sensor triggers. And the sensor is at location F1 and F2. And each sensor, so we've got two two bytes for the sensors, and each sensor direction has four bits assigned to it. The first bit says whether the sensor is active. So if you've not got anything to the left of you, it, the automaton doesn't have anything to the left of it. There will always be a zero in the sensor active box and zeros in the sense type. Although these don't matter. If there's a zero in here, these don't matter. They don't tell you anything. However, if there's a one in the sensor active, that means there's something to the left of you. And these three bits will denote what? And so far I've got wall <coughs> and another automaton. And then we could maybe start to think about, um, I mean, for example, the paint idea, maybe I could write that there is paint to the left of you and then the color gets stored in another in another memory location. Um, I don't know, maybe you could have a package, a switch, something like that. So um, this, these two bytes, uh, which denote the sensors, um, so the sensors have two bytes attached to them. And that's it, that's, that's, that's all I've talked about for the sensors for now. Now the real juicy stuff is the architecture and I've finally ended up with this Harvard architecture. Yes, I know. Why have I gone with Harvard? Well, I've gone with Harvard instead of von Neumann because I'm a maniac. <laughs> um, I've gone with Harvard because I, I don't think I know, I don't think I understand enough about how an assembly instruction set is stored, um, a, like a complex instruction set is stored for me to be able to design this in any other way. Because I just couldn't understand how to build into my instructions when I'm only using six, I'm only using four bits for my instructions. So I've only got 16 instructions. 
And as far as I'm aware, with a Cisc instruction set, you will have a, a, a risk instruction set that sits underneath it. Boo, Harvard bad, von Neumann good. Yes, I know. I know von Neumann is, is like the the number one go-to. But let's be honest, um, you know, Harvard exists for a reason. And, and actually the place, the thing that ha that Harvard is existing for is exactly this situation, which is we're building a very custom specific CPU. Like we're designing this from the ground up. Um, so that's that's why I've gone with Harvard was because I, I just didn't really know how to achieve this with a risk instruction set because I was thinking like what happens if you have a complex instruction like load the A register with this memory location like how, how do you denote that well I might need to take up each instruction might take up one memory location or it might take up three memory locations and if we think back to the LMC which is the little man computer from Peter Higginson this really really great um, CPU simulator that's used but I've, I've used this for teaching assembly programming for years and none of my A-level students have, have ever struggled with it every time you write an instruction into the box here so let's say we write LDA 6 uh, look LDA 3 um, add for store 5 let's say we submit this and assemble it you can see that my first instruction LDA 3 comes 503 and takes up run position zero every single instruction every single opcode and operand that you write in the LMC takes up a single memory location in RAM and I wanted that that's what I wanted because I want the line of code that you've written to correspond to the location in memory that that instruction is stored as a machine code instruction. So it needed to be one to one. And with CISC, it could not have been one to one. And using RISC, I could not, I, I just couldn't think of a way to get this working. And the reason I couldn't think to get it working was if I'm going for 8 bit memory locations. My opcode's 3 bits, let's say. My operand is 5 bits. This is what I originally designed. Then I can only address 5 bits on the address bus because my operand can only be 5 bits. So I need the operand to be 8 bits. And in that case, I might as well make the opcode 4 bits. Let's go with a Harvard architecture. And this is the Harvard architecture here. And the Harvard architect architecture states that the data and instructions are just held on separate separate memory chips like that's it that's how simple it is so i've got this memory chip here and i, I know this might not exist in real life but i mean you could realistically just use um i, I haven't said what it is yet but <laughs> this is a um an eprom with an eprom and electron electronically programmable read-only memory so basically a, a flash chip where we would write our program to so we would flash our program to this chip here in real life like we'd hey Paul thanks for joining uh, just talking through through architecture decisions um, done a lot of thinking this week so we'd have the CEPROM which is an electronically progr programmable read-only memory so what we would do is if you were physically building this like you would literally unplug the chip erase it using the computer flash a new ROM to it flash a new instruction set to it plug it back in and then run it again and that's how you would debug this now, I've gone with an 8-bit address bus, which means that we've got 256 memory locations. And this is where the unconventional side comes in. Because if I need 8-bit operands and 4-bit opcodes, then I only need 12 bits. So I'm only going to simulate 12 bits. EEPROM, electronically erasable programmable read-only memory. Um, yeah, I, I, I know what an EEPROM is. I thought then just an EEPROM was... I thought an EEPROM was a thing as well. Am I, is that wrong? Have I got a misconception then? So this might not be an EEPROM. An EEPROM might not actually exist. I'm just going to change this now. Nobody saw me make that mistake. So I, I thought an EEPROM was a thing as well. But Luke's saying that it's actually only an EEPROM. So an EEPROM is an electronically erasable, programmable read-only memory. And what that basically means is that you run um, an electronic... Uh, you, you run an electronic signal through the chip and that wipes it 
um, traditional. Um, so I, I thought an EEPROM on its own was just one of the ones where you you have like a, a, a basically a hole in the top of it and you'd shine a UV light on it and that would erase the memory on the chip. What's that called, Luke? There you go. That's what I was thinking of when I put EEPROM, but I was just going for sort of this generic read-only memory. It is, but they have to be erased, reset using UV light, so EEPROMs are better. Yes. So I am right, but also, you're, well, we're both right. But yeah, we'd want this to be an EEPROM because with an EEPROM, it is electronically programmable, but it's not electronically erasable. So what you have to do is you have to basically get a UV light and shine it over the top, and that's what erases the data. So they're just older. Um, but basically, we want a programmable read-only memory. We're simulating this anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But for the sake of, um, you know, for the sake of completion, I think it's important that we denote how how this would work on a real chip. Next question, Luke: Can you get 12-bit? Could you get um, an EEPROM or an EEPROM with an 8-bit data bus, with an 8-bit address bus, and a 12-bit data bus? Like, can you get 12-bit memory locations, or would it only be 16-bit? So, if you built this in real life, I think what you'd have to do is go with a 16-bit um, data bus. Well, it wouldn't be the bus, uh, a 16 bit word length, and then just not use four of them. I think that's what you'd have to do. Don't quote me on it. Um, we'll probably get the answer in chat. Luke knows a lot more about electronics than me, but yeah, so we've got this, um, we've got this 12 bit, um, programmable read only memory. And then we have to have something in the CPU itself to handle that. So that's the current instruction register. So the current instruction register would read directly from here. The reason the program counter and the current instruction register I've put separate, I've put them in the control unit, in the control unit, like, you know, what difference does that make? Um, basically, the reason I've put them separate is because the program counter is going to address this memory over here. So the only way of addressing this memory is going to be using uh, this program counter. So the program counter is going to denote is going to talk to this bus here. This program counter will never talk to the memory bus, only the instruction bus. And then when the data comes in, these 12 bits are going to get read into the current instruction register. Obviously, we have our opcode, which are the first four bits, and that's what's going to be used for doing the decoding. And then we're going to have these eight bits here, which are the operand, which can then be read into any of our multipurpose or otherwise eight bit registers. And we've only got five of these now because I actually don't need all these um, combined registers. So we've got the A register, which is the accumulator standard does the standard thing, which is um, that will hold data when we read it in our write to memory. Got the B register, the C register. These are just two multi-purpose registers, which basically we're going to store data in. Uh, you're correct. Either a 16-bit one or daisy chain, an 8-bit and a 4-bit one together. Cool. So we wouldn't be able to get uh, a 12-bit programmable read-only memory if we were building this in real life. We'd have to go with some combination of either an 8-bit and a 4-bit programmable read-only memory where we we combined the bits together. Or we just go with a six. I think it'd be easier. You go with a 16 bit one and you leave four of the bits redundant. Basically, you just don't plug them in. Right. But yeah, so we've got our A register, our accumulator. We've got B and C, which are sort of our, our general purpose registers that we might store data in. Um, 16 bit would probably be cheaper than buying two chips. Yeah. Uh, the overheads for the two chips would be more expensive. Um, we've got the F register. I've got no idea what this is going to do yet. I'm just putting it there because every CPU has a flags register so that's for our carry bit our zero our carry flag our zero flag a parity flag who knows what else you know maybe we can use the other five bits of that for something useful I don't know um, I don't know if it even needs to be eight bits we could maybe just make it five three bits I, d I don't know um, Basically, I'm thinking from the fact that, yeah, you wouldn't be able to buy a three bit register for it and also reading in and out of it would be really difficult. So if we wanted to read the value of the flag register into the um, into the accumulator, then we sort of need the flag register to be the same word length as the accumulator. So that's why it's eight bits. But we do have some redundancy in there. And then finally, the HL, which is basically our memory address register. So this is what is going to talk to the RAM 
and the RAM is going to have 240 usable locations and that will be specifically RAM for the user. This isn't going to have any instruction data in it. And then lastly, we've got our 16 rever uh, reserved data locations. Uh, it's imp important for Turing completeness. It allows for conditionals. Um, what the having the flag register as 8-bit Luke is that what it makes it Turing complete? What about what? Why would having a non 8-bit flag register make it non Turing complete? There you go. <laughs> right, so here we go. We've got our architecture. This is what our CPU is going to look like. I mean, it's not. We're not going to build it. Maybe, maybe we'll build it at some point um, in real life. But uh, you know, we're going to be simulating it for now. So our instruction set. We've got four usable bits for the instruction set. So we've got our four zero bits would be adapt or no op instruction. So basically, this allows us just to insert uh, raw data as the operand. We've got LDA, SDA, this is our load and store instruction, push and pop. One thing that's not included in the architecture here is um, we would also need, I think, an SP register, which is the stack pointer. And then we would also need a stack. I've not decided how big that is, but I'm thinking maybe a 16 data location stack. So we'd be able to basically push and pop 16 times. I don't think more than that would ever be necessary. Maybe maybe we make it two, five, six. Maybe we make it an eight bit stack. I don't know. I don't know what the convention there is. Um, I've, I've sort of omitted it because it wasn't something that was going to be a design decision. I knew exactly how we were going to achieve it, which is you just just make a stack, right? And you and you have a register um, for the stack pointer. Also, I do really apologise. I've got a really um, bit of a cold at the minute. I watched my previous video back and I'm really sniffly. I'm still sniffly today, so. Sorry about that. I'll uh, I'll try and mute if I need to snook at any point. So we've got push and pop instructions, which is going to allow us to push and pop from that CPU stack. Uh, we have add and sub, ink and dec, increment and decrement. Basically, add one, take one. Um, this will so the add and sub instruction will say add to the accumulator and subtract from the accumulator. The special increment and decrement instructions will actually allow you to increment and decrement the values direct in memory so that's what's special about them i don't know how you do that in real hardware i don't know if that's actually what it's for um but yeah we've got increment and decrement so that would allow us to increment and decrement the values in registers um just the existence of the register is for turing completeness it doesn't matter the size it is usually the same size of the registers due to the designers already having the 8-bit registers on hand better to have too much space than too little cool so the flag register is needed for turing completeness because without the flag register we wouldn't be able to do conditional jumps and the fact that we're able to do conditional jumps aka if the value is zero jump here otherwise jump there the very fact we're able to do that is what allows us to write program flow which makes it Turing complete cool thank you for clarifying Luke um, it doesn't matter the size but we'd go with 8-bit because everything else is 8-bit so you just want to keep it the same size right so we've got increment decrement and um, we've got our three um, logical operations there's more than this but these are the three that you need to basically create a combination of any of the others um, so we've got and we've got R and we've got XR um, so if you don't know what bitwise manipulation is I'm not going to go into it right now um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of it in a second when I show you sort of my, my first example program that I've written um, for this instruction set. But basically, uh, this this is our logic control. Then we've got our three conditional instructions, which are JMP or BRA, basically jump or branch always. So this will always jump to the given um, instruction. We have JP slash BRP, branch if positive, jump if positive. This will only jump if the value in the accumulator is zero or greater, or just greater than zero. That's a design decision. Um, I'll have to choose. And then finally, we've got this JZ or BRZ, which means branch if zero or jump if zero. This goes a little bit against convention because you normally see JNZ, which is jump not zero, but that's basically the same as BRP. No, it's not, but it does something very similar. Basically, these you need, with these three, you can write very complex program control. In fact, all you'd need is JZ and JMP. 
you wouldn't even need this BRP, but I want it because, you guessed it, the LMC has it. If we look at the LMC instruction set, we've got BRA, branch always, BRZ, branch if zero, BRP, branch if positive. And I wanted to keep these three the same as the little man computer because I want students who have learned how to write assembly code in the little man computer to have an obvious step forward to jump onto the automaton instead. Okay, last one, last instruction I've gone with is CLF. Clear flags will basically just write zero to the flag register. <sighs> Don't know why. Um, just had a spare instruction, so thought I'd do something with it. Cool, right, so that is our instruction set. Here's our new instruction words length. Uh, as you can see, we have a four bit opcode and we have an eight bit operand. And this is, this I think gives us Turing completeness, I think. Um, in fact, I spoke to Luke and he didn't point out anything that prevented Turing completeness, so there you go. Now, uh, here's my example program. So you can see that we have a grid. Uh, we've got a wall here. We've got a horizontal wall here. We've got an automatron here. And the simple problem is to patrol right and left between the two walls. So we want this automaton to go, automaton to go boop, 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 until it detects this wall, at which point it starts going left and goes boop, 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 boop to the other wall and just continuously patrols between the two. So what does that look like? It looks like this. So our first instruction is BRA move right, and that is going to jump straight to this line here. The reason we do that is because um, this really confused me when I first started writing assembly code back in like 2013. So I'm probably not going to over explain this, but basically we want to write data into memory. We want all that data to be defined somewhere. Might as well define it at the top here. And then we our first instruction needs to basically be after this. So we're going to jump over all of our data to load right, LDA right, which is this value here, 00100000000. And then we're saying STA F0. So it's loading this byte here and we're storing it at address F0. And if you look at address F0, it is our movement control. So what would a value of 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 do? Well, 0, oh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK, we write that into there. We're going to move right on the next clock cycle and then write a 0 back. So simple enough. Uh, we're going to be telling the automaton to move right. That's what that instruction says load right, store it in the movement register, so that's going to make it move right. And then we've got a no op, and that's just while the movement takes place, and then allowing for the flag register to update. And then we're loading, uh, not the flag register, the sensor register to update, and then we're loading F1. F1 is our proximity sensor for left and right. And then we're anding it with the RT and mask, which is this one here, the RT and mask, and you can see it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So if we and whatever's in the accumulator with this byte here, it's going to mask out the left hand bits and only focus on the right hand bits. Then we're going to XOR that with the RT mask, which is this here. We're going to XOR it with this. And this is basically going to say, if the proximity sensor is active and the thing next to it is a wall then move right because we'll skip over this instruction but if the value is zero I'm not going to go into bitwise manipulation and explain why this works um, maybe once the game's built you can come and try out this program yourself if you want to work out why this works but we're using bitwise manipulation and basically if it matches if the value in the register is the same as this value here which means there's a wall to the right of me 
then after we run XRRT mask, we'll have a value of zero in the accumulator, which means BRZ, branch of zero, will trigger. And we'll jump to this move left function, which does the exact same thing, but all the data is reversed so that we're going the other direction. And that's it. That is everything I've done since the last stream. Um, I've architected the solution. And the reason I wanted to do this was twofold. Firstly, I wanted to make sure when I came on the next stream that I actually knew what I was talking about. <laughs> And secondly, I want this to work the way a proper CPU would work. Forget the fact that a real CPU might use CISC and that you might not have the luxury of having a single instruction address with a single instruction in it. Forget about all that. What this allows you to do is teach real concepts but simplified that's why I've gone with a reduced instruction set Harvard is more complex I know Harvard is more complex but if you never knew how to use von Neumann architecture or you'd never thought about why von Neumann was von Neumann then you'd have no barrier to learning this and that's the aim is I want students a level students gcse students uni students self-taught students anyone to be able to pick this up and learn real life concepts that are applicable in real life and that's why i've done all this architect i didn't just want to simulate this and just make it work magically with code i want this to be representative of what real hardware does and now we're at this point we can start to think about our programming again and I'm actually gonna just quit out of QuickTime and get rid of my iPad for now but there we go so that is that is the fully architected solution as far as I'm aware that uh, it's not perfect I know it's not perfect there's definitely things that are going to be glaringly wrong with it and we're going to run into some problems with it um, but yeah for now I'm, I'm happy that that solves the problem and in fact I've just realized I've put my iPad away uh, I've also gone off camera I've just realized I've put my iPad away and now I can't see my plans so no messages I need to reply to cool so let's grab my iPad get it set up so I can refer to my design as we go is that going to stand up there yeah there we go so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh i was thinking of doing away with using strings for these binary values and just using numbers to represent them the main reason for that is that the string manipulation of the string manipulation required when writing bytes in and out is going to be a bit more expensive. However, it's going to make coding it not more not simpler, but just easier to do because I'm going to be able to actually see the values held rather than having to do a mental mental switch between binary and deanery so that's going to be helpful and more importantly the only time we'd have an issue is if we're doing lots and lots of string manipulation for lots and lots of automatons and i think at this prototyping stage it's just not something that i am concerned with yeah i'm just not concerned with it so the first thing we're going to do is get rid of that hl register which doesn't need to be a combined register um i know you don't have the reference material in front of you anymore um but i promise you it's all still there in fact do we want this to be a dictionary do you want to map this as a dictionary instead yeah let's do that this dot registers equals a dictionary 
and we're going to say map a to that map b to that cool so we've got the a register the b register the c register the f register the hl register the program counter and the cir and the cir is going to have four extra bytes um a b c f h l p c and then we're going to have i mean should i just break the cir up into two bits should i just have no we're going to do that we're going to we're going to store it as as proper data so we've got the 12 bits stored in the current instruction register so that's our register um I don't want to do everything at once. I was just thinking then, why don't we create all of our data locations, set up our reserved locations. But no, let's, for now, let's just get the editor working. So uh, if we go to index.html, remember we have this I register, O register, F register. We don't want that anymore. We want I, we want A, B, C, F, P, H, L, PC and we're going to get rid of we're actually going to get rid of register on there we're just going to do that and then our last one is going to be made up of two and it's going to be um, opcode and operand So that's held in the CIR, but obviously it's sp actually split up into two parts, the 4-bit opcode, the 8-bit operand. Um, so we want the PC, um, HL, F, C, B, A. Yes, can't be asked. Um, right. We also had our editor here. That's fine, loading the instructions in like that. We're obviously going to need to change that once we're actually doing the the proper assembly, but for now that's fine. Um, but now we want A, B, C, F, H, L, P, C. Um, I think that's right. I don't know if this is actually going to work. I don't know if I need to make the keys strings or not. I I don't think I do, but we're going to find out in a second. F H L. Also, H L would it would technically be the memory address register from like my actual lessons, but I think that calling it H L is probably better because this is what you'll see in real programming. So the the point of this is almost to be a stepping stone. And I mean, because I do a lot of GBZ80 Game Boy assembly programming, what I'm almost thinking of this as is a stepping stone from the little man computer, which is a deanery CPU, to something that's a little bit more similar to a real CPU and kind of modeling it a little bit on the Game Boy CPU. It's quite accessible. I mean, it's not. It's it's brutally difficult to learn. Um, LearnGameBoy.com if you're interested. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm sort of thinking about this as. So let's see if this works. Uh, I haven't really thought about it too much, but we've got A, B, C, F, H, L, P, C. If I select that, uh, yeah, nah, that didn't work because... Why didn't that work? In fact, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do this. Bam. We're going to put a lot of these on one line. Just to tidy it up a little bit. That's better. A, B, C, F, H, L, P, C. 
I'll code up around. So when we're clicking on this, I'm guessing we're getting an error in our console. Can I read property of undefined reading HTML input element? Editor.js document.getElement by ID a.value equals automatron. In fact, I need to rename that in the editor because that should be automaton. Da 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 da. Need to get out of the habit of calling these automatrons because that was a different game, I swear. I promise. Uh, right, so we want to get um, automatons current or selected automaton um, dot registers. Yeah, why isn't that anything? We did say this dot registers, right? When we construct it. What about if we do this? We click assemble and we try and get the instructions. So the instructions are getting stored. Why isn't it storing these registers? Is that actually wrong? Does it need to be like that? Let's get rid of that for now just to test it. Can't do that. What about that? Okay, yeah. Alright, we're going to just make them strings. Wow. Now would be a good time for enums. Right, Matt, you never sent me anything about enums. I'm going to look it up myself. I mean, this is TypeScript, not JavaScript. Is it the same thing? Does it class as the same thing? I mean, it says just to use symbols. Static members as a class. Okay, so we could just make a... a register class. And then we could say... Wait. No, I hate that. Matt, you said you're going to send me some stuff about enums. Is this it? Is this right? Is this what you're on about? Because these aren't enums. These are like. Is this is this right? Can I do this? Is that right? Can I do that? Enum register. Enum declarations can only be used in TypeScript files. Right, I'm going to convert this to TypeScript then. I'm getting kind of topic. and class bodies, yada yada yada. How do I... I mean, yeah, I don't think I should do this on stream. I need to learn what TypeScript is. Okay, we're going to do away with that for now. Again, um, we're just going to stick with this awful method for now of defining them using strings for the keys. So B, C, F, P, C, HL. And then finally, we're going to have 
CIR. Just going to have an extra four bits on it. Like that. Um, in fact, no, let's change extension to .ts, I believe. Is it actually that simple, Luke? Well, is there any issues with different browsers if I do that? I mean, I know that there's a massive delay in the chat, so you're not going to answer me for a few minutes. But I'm just going to press forward with this, and then I, I can play it. I mean, you, you were going to say that too. You're not even a programmer, Alex. Probably a hacky way of doing it, but I think it might work for now. Okay, all right, I'm going to try it. Let's rename this. Yeah, how do I rename it easily? Rename objects.ts. But that means they all need to be .ts, right? So do I just make them all .ts? Right, if this doesn't work, you're all fired. Right, rename that, rename that, rename that. Let's make that TypeScript. Okay, go to index. Let's rename all of these to TypeScript, 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 TypeScript. Um, please work. Uh oh. Okay. Okay, so that does work. Okay, so enum registers equals a a stop auto fill in b c f p c h l op code operand. I've never done TypeScript before, but instead of it, it's just strict typing on JavaScript. So, does that mean I need to declare types for all of these now? So, could be quite wrong though. Um, TypeScript function with a typed argument parameter. TypeScript function with type parameter, uh, moron functions, a colon string, sum arg is a number, <sighs> like I've got to learn a whole new language now. Thanks for this sidetrack TypeScript um, class uh, parameters, class fields. Greeting is a string. Okay, so it's just like that. So we say x is a number, uh, y is a number, registers is... Um, Declared dictionary TypeScript class. Uh, I could be quite wrong though. No, it seems like you're right, Luke. Um, it might be worth just sticking with JavaScript for now and changing to TypeScript later on. Yeah, you say that, but then I'll never end up doing it. Declare and initialize a dictionary in TypeScript. Person is p1 equals first name and last name. I mean, this is all just so complicated. 
Yeah, I'm I'm just undoing this. I'm just going to stick with what I had. Sorry, boys. <sighs> undo, 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 undo. What I know so far is that TypeScript is not as simple as just changing JS to TS. Um, so, yeah, back to where we were already up to a while ago. So CIR, I think it might actually be worth breaking this up or is it yeah let's break this up into opcode and operand and we'll have that as four bits and we'll have that as a regular eight bit register yeah I do like that good call I feel thank you Luke I also feel it was a good call because otherwise we were going to spend literally the next hour and a half sat watching me fail to write TypeScript. Okay, so what time are we on? We're only on half eight. So I've got about an hour and a half left to try and actually make something happen tonight. So uh, opcode operand, uh, assembler, editor. So we need these all to be strings. Um, and do that, yada, yada, yada. And then did I actually rename them in here? Um, uh, where were we? A, B, C, F, H, L, P, C, opcode, operand. Like that. And then uh, we want in here we need to add opcode and operand in. I was long-winded, do that, do that. Right, now this should work, he says. Get rid of that, we'll click on this. Cool, so here's all of our data loaded in so we can inspect what's going on in each of our registers. Right, so our next step then is going to be We, we need to create the RAM and the RAM. God damn, this is going to be kind of gross. So let, let's do this, right? Let's go in here. Let's grab where the where this is. Let's say that the div is going to be uh, height 600, like that. And then we'll set overflow y to auto. And then we've got this editor. And then we're going to add a border like that. Um, no, I kind of hate that border um, unless we had some padding in. Padding uh, five pixels. And now still kind of gross. Oh well, uh, not important. So height oh. six hundred pixels. Overflow y auto. Um, height six hundred pixels. Overflow y auto. And. What was the last one I wanted to do? Uh, border we got rid of. So if we save that, refresh this, that should be like that. Cool. So now I can scroll up and down within there, which is helpful. Um, so I want this word editor to be above it, but I don't really care right now. In fact, I'm just going to get rid of that for the Tom Bean. Um, God damn it. Get rid of that. Okay, so. We've got this built now, which is looking a little bit nicer, but we're going to need to create. I mean, this is our instructions, so let's bring that back in and we're going to call that our instructions. 
and we're going to need that to go all the way up to right let's do this programmatically instead so we're doing and hashtag whatever one and hashtag 13 one and hashtag 13 two and hashtag 13 rows equals 256 overflow none that's right and we're going to give it an ID equal to uh, instruction editor. And then editor.js, we're going to have a uh, document dot onload equals function. Awesome. VOY.FYI, you can get out of my chat. Hide user. Um, so we're going to have an onload function here and in this we're going to say for var i i equals zero i is less than i equals one i is less than or equal to 256 i plus plus what we're going to do is we're going to generate that string so um, var num nums equals empty string and then for each of these we're going to say nums plus equals um, the value of i followed by and what was it it was like something and hashtag 13 like that and then we're going to say um, document dot get element by ID and the thing we called it was instructions editor dot in text equals nums I think Yo, that, that did not work uh, at all. Um, and what we also need to do is set the height of the other two thingies to 256 and 256. Like that. So that at least looks right, but why is that not? Let's see if we just run that code on its own. Is it just the fact that it's not triggering that's the problem? Do I need to escape this and hashtag 13? Does anyone know what and hashtag 13 is? Off the top of their heads? Carriage return enter. Oh, it's just a new line. It's just a HTML escape code for a new line. Of course it is, obviously. Right, so that's not running when the document loads. So instead, we're going to create this as a function called load line numbers. And we're going to call it. So we're going to grab all of this and we're going to have the same thing again here. Um, but we're going to call this the. Um, we're going to call it the RAM editor. We're going to call it that for now. It's not what it actually is. We're going to have it as RAM. Has this even got an ID equals assembled? We're going to get rid of that entirely. We don't need that at all. And we're going to add another eight columns onto this so it fills it up to the right size. Kind of feel like this needs to be quite a bit bigger. Um, maybe that should be like 32 instead. And so that's 24 bigger. So that'd be 52. 
but then we can take a bit off that, let's make that 10. So we'd move, take that down to 42. In fact, we can probably make that, yeah. All right, we'll go with that. We'll just see what it looks like. And this is gonna be called RAM. So there's our instructions. There's our RAM, I got that slightly wrong. We need another like, don't even know. That's too big. Uh, it actually needs to be 12. It does actually need to be 12. So that needs to be 12 columns. That can be 10, that's fine. LD push pop for LDA space hashtag. Yeah, I mean, 10 is fine for that. Um, so that is 12 plus 10 is 22 plus 1 is 23. So this wants to be 22, I think, maybe. Yeah, it's not, it's not the same width. I don't know why. Uh, I can't seem to get that right. Um, and I also feel like we'd want these on the top instead. So let's put, for now, let's just grab that and that. and put them there for the time being. Like this this is gonna get an entire redesign. We just need it to make sense for what we're doing right now. Um, and in fact, we could just set um, overflow on these equal to, I'll get rid of the overflow none. And uh, set the rows for 205.6. Style equals height is going to be 400 pixels. Good. Yeah, I'm undoing that. Yeah, I'm just messing about with HTML and CSS now. God, it takes so long. Right, so we've got this set up. Um, I just need to call in the onload. Of here. The function, which is load line numbers, I think. Why is that not calling? Unexpected token. What's the unexpected token? Function load line numbers like that needs to actually be a function. So why is that not working for thingy? Um, so the line numbers actually needs to be three wide. God damn it! Why did I take this on? Right, three, three. Try that. Load line numbers. How to create a new line in JavaScript. It needs to, so I need to insert a BR then. So I was at a new line before. No, I don't. Does it need to be escaped? Does it need to be escaped? The backslash n. I really don't know what's going on here. Why this string isn't writing correctly. 
insert new line into text area JavaScript. Backslash backslash r backslash n. I mean that's a true align break, right? Oh my god, what am I doing wrong? Any any suggestions? Why is the new line not getting? This one says triple backslash n. How to add new line breaks in a text area using JavaScript. No, nope. I don't know how long I spent on this originally, but it can't have been this long. This says to do an escaped br. I've never used text areas before. I'll do some googling. Cheers, Luke. So what? An escaped br? It was just ignoring my tag before. Why would it listen to it now? This is ass. This is actually ass. And the problem is it's a variable number of digits per. I could do that. And I could say if i is less than 10 nums plus equals that single space and if i is less than 100 nums plus equals a space <laughs> I mean that's gonna work right it needs to be two spaces apparently or three spaces I was trying the Unicode HTML but it was just putting it in as the Unicode HTML I think I can try it. What's that doing? It literally just loads it in. So the unload maybe needs to go in the body as well. So maybe that's what's causing that. I'm sure you. I was sure you could do that with the unload. Apparently not. I'll stick it in the body instead. Right, we'll try that. Yeah. Right. In fact, what I could do is have just something with P1 and hashtag 13. Two like that, and then we're going to set the ID of this equal to test. And now, if we grab that, let's just see what the value actually is. Document dot get uh, by ID test dot inner text. It's not showing that as a anything special. This is really going to be the death of me. This is awful. Come on. Come on, JavaScript. Be my friend. 
New line in text area. Text area and new line out. I have to do sub div. No. This guy says and hashtag zero one three and hashtag zero. Well, that's obviously for B B B. stuck on this. Why doesn't backslash n work like that 100% should be working? All the way up to 256. God, this is an exciting stream, isn't it? Right, do I just move on? Now, I kind of feel like this is a pretty important thing to have working. Also, why, when I put this as a couple of columns, does it do that? Text area. Oh! Value! Oh my god! Oh my god. Uh, that kind of hurts. I'm not going to lie. And we need to set the overflow to none. Which it already should have been. Huh, why has it got an overflow on it? Luke, don't even laugh, mate. Don't even laugh. Yeah, that was wrong. Does need to be three. Yeah, I know. I just realised then that I'd set the inner text and then had a moment. Why is it giving me this scroll wheel? What does it mean? Invalid. Is it hidden? Oh my god, I'm such a bad programmer today. I mean, I think that's something I did ages ago, though. Overflow none, overflow none, overflow none. Set that to hidden. They're all actually correct now. There we go. We've got a proper editor with 256 lines for entering code into it. Uh, we've got run, reset, help. At the bottom of here, we've got uh, the assemble button, which actually needs to go under the instructions, not the RAM. So if I type an instruction in here, test, and well, if I click on this, I click write and test, I click on assemble, click off of it, click back in, it loads it back in, bang. Okay. Hey man, we've all been there. Yep. Yep, we've all been there, plugging away at something. 
what time are we on? Um, right, we've got an hour and ten minutes, so that just took us ages. For absolutely no reason, just because I put the wrong thing in. Uh, so, the last thing we're going to do is we're just going to get line numbers for this RAM editor. So, let's go in here and do the same thing for... Oops. RAM editor. Refresh that. I mean, it's not actually an editor. In fact, that's going to be set to disabled. Uh, like that. Because you won't be able to edit the values of it, you'll just be able to inspect them. Uh, okay, I, f I feel like we've got everything we need now. So, LDA hashtag. Oh, this could be like, for example, percent zero zero one zero one zero zero zero. So that needs to be a little bit more than ten. Let's make it sixteen instead. That's a opcode, a operand plus the nine. Yeah, we, we've got more than enough with sixteen. And then we're going to make the columns on this a little bit bigger. So we're going to say 30, why not? And that's not too far off. We'll go with 31. I think that brings them to the actual same value. Ish, maybe, maybe not. Cool, it doesn't really matter at this point. So let's uh, let's let's actually commit this. So uh, set up registers um, and uh, change editor improve I mean I wouldn't say it's improved yet it doesn't do anything but it will be improved and it kind of has all the information that we need in it so we've got run we've got reset we've got help uh, we probably need to step in there run reset help we're gonna put another button in for step uh, like that uh, I did realize that we have an on click in somewhere here, which is what's calling causing us an issue. Because we've got on click equals edit there, uh, which might have done something useful before, but I am not interested right now. Okay, so we've got all of that. Now, what we need to do is write something. Uh, Right, let's create an array with 256. Array.prototype.fill. Uh, no. I just want new array len dot fill. So uh, let's go in here and we're going to say uh, this dot instructions equals array. Two five six dot fill with empty strings and we're going to say this dot uh, ram equals array 256 dot fill with one two three four five six seven eight zeros and I might add something in that allows you to switch between binary and hex for this or I might not um, I haven't decided yet um, but yeah, so we should now have them. Let's double check that they actually are created when we refresh the page. So we're going to get the list of automatons selected automaton 
dot ram. I oh, know, I just didn't select them because I'm an idiot again. Nice. Cool, so we're reading instructions in naively at the minute, we're just doing this. So, uh, load, load automaton, we instead of that, um, we want to create a string. So, um, var instructions equals an empty string for var i equals zero. i is less than automaton dot instructions dot length i plus plus and we want to say instructions dot uh, plus equals uh, automaton dot instructions i with a new line and then we're going to set this equal to instructions instead let's try that Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Woo, so we'll say if automa.instructions i equals blank string, then break. So we'll only do it up until the point that we have. Cool. So if I do LDA uh, 5, STA 7, we click on assemble. I mean, that's kind of annoying. <laughs> Might have to take these buttons out of here um, <laughs> instead because that's annoying as hell. Uh, but if we click off of it and we click back on it. Oh, Jesus Christ. Of course it is because we're writing over it. So now we need to... Uh, assembler some sort of instructions equals document dot get element code dot value so we're gonna instead say um, dot split at the new line like that so select an automaton LDA five STA seven Click off of it, click back on it, I didn't assemble it, LDA 5, STA 7, scroll all the way down to assemble, scroll all the way back up, click off of it, click onto it, there we go. So we're actually storing those instructions now, um, which is nice. So the next step that we need to do is actually write our assembler. <laughs> Yay. Um, so, var valid opcodes equals an array of opcodes that are valid. And in this, we are going to have 16 opcodes. And those 16 opcodes are dat. Not LDA STA. That's the fun bit. Yep, yeah, right in the assembly is absolutely the fun bit, Luke. Push pop add sub ink deck. And or XR JMP BRA BRP JP BRP JZ BRZ C 
CLF. That's all of our valid opcodes. And now we want to map opcodes to machine code equals turns to shelf and stares at dragon book <laughs> so um funny thing you weren't here last week luke i did mention the dragon book last week uh it's not actually that helpful in this particularly because we're using um particularly because we're using a reduced instruction set the number of cases we have to manage are very limited so there's no tokenization we don't have to like tokenize it um Let's just use substring in general and regex in emergency situations. I, yeah, I don't think you even need regex. Like, what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to do for each um, value, do a split, look at the left-hand side, see if it's a valid opcode. If it's a valid opcode, um, see if its operand is valid. Like, I'm, I'm going to literally brute force this. Brute force this. There's, there's no reason not to. So, here we're going to have... That is zero 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 zero. This needs to be a dictionary. Nop is also zero zero zero. Get away. I don't want you. Go away. Yeah, Dragon Book is more for a compiler, whereas this is an assembler, to be fair. Yeah, uh, and not only is it an assembler, but it's a reduced instruction set assembler. So it makes things much, much simpler. So we've got 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Is that right? Deck is 8. 8. 9 10 11 12 13 14 wait what 1 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 1 0 0 1 1 1 0 0 1 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 1 Ah, yeah, of course. It's because this is the same as this. This is the same as this. This. What if I missed out? BRP1101. One, one, Okay, so that's all of our mappings. So, uh, BRB just got to take some washing out and put another load in. Aww, oh, thanks for telling me, Luke. Const var. So it should be a const instead of a var. Because this is never going to change. So uh, that's going to be at the top. And then we're going to write our assemble function below here. And what we're going to do is... We're gonna say uh, we're gonna say output equals a string. I can still offer my expertise. Awesome, Alex. Uh, what do you think about? <laughs> What do you think about assembly code versus what do you think about writing an assembler versus a compiler? Uh, so just just um, to sort of fill in the blanks, um, when you're writing an assembler, you're writing sort of a one-to-one -one conversion between the assembler and machine code, which these are basically mnemonics and um, they just stand for a machine code instruction. Whereas when you have a higher level language, something like Python, something like C or Java. Um, you've got like things like for loops, you've got things like variables. Like you can see here, I've got a function. Now the idea of a function doesn't exist like on, on the processor itself. So um, getting from this higher level language to something that is executable 
by the CV any that's executable by the CPU it's just a lot more work to get there whereas with this you just it's 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 like a one-to-one -one translation think of it a little bit like trans I mean this is this is not a great example I mean this is actually probably quite a good example so like Czechoslovakia used to be a country it's now Czech Republic and Slovakia um, Czech and Slovakia are very very similar languages to the point where you can almost like they're almost the same language and you can translate directly between the two whereas if you're going from Czech to Chinese you'd have to do like the, gra the grammar and the form of the words is very very different so you have to translate them in a much more complicated way it's a little bit like that um, machine code and assembly language are just they, their grammar and syntax is the same so you're just literally converting one to the other um, so you're just checking that everything's valid so what we're going to do here is we're going to do uh, var input so our input is this value here and we're going to split it at the new line and then for instruction in input uh, opcode equals instruction I'm just going to do this twice to make it explicit what we're doing so we're going to split this at the space and we're going to take the zeroth value Uh, in fact, we're going to say var components equals instructions dot split at the space. And we're going to say if components dot length is not e is great not equal to one and components dot length is not equal to two because we can only have a valid component uh, through of these uh, then when we say error equals error on error on line var i equals zero i is less than input dot length I plus plus equals instruction input I dot split. If components dot length is not equal to one and components dot length is not equal to two, error on line uh, I plus one. Um, I don't know what the error is. I don't know what to say for that error. Um, so just error on line whatever for now. So uh, there's cases where this would actually be wrong because we'd want to check if it contains a comment. So we want to handle comments with a semicolon. Um, Um, if input i 
dot includes a semicolon. Then we want to do something slightly different. We want to pull out the comment. input i equals input i dot split the zero so we want to take everything from the comment. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> um, Okay, so what we're doing here is we're looking if the input includes a semicolon. If the semicolon is at the start of the comment, then we continue. Otherwise, um, we if it's at the start of the line, we continue. Otherwise, we split at space semicolon and then continue to manage the rest of it so we're basically re re deleting the comment this is deleting the comment and then continuing because the the assembly doesn't care about the comment we will maintain it but we'll maintain it somewhere else so error on line so and so var op code equals instruction dot split space zero so that's just going to be components zero and then we're going to say if uh, op code if valid op codes opcodes dot includes the opcode that we've been given so basically if the opcode that we've pulled out is in this list of valid opcodes then we want to do something else so we want to check if uh, opcode equals dat in fact now let's do the no op ones first not or opcode equals CLF. XOR or and ink deck add sub push push and pop or opcode equals push or opcode equals pop then we want to store them the place we're going to store them is going to be a thing of instructions Instructions. I just thought we don't we don't even need this in here. We just need an empty. Just need an empty array for the time being. Let's 
just test this really quickly. Click assemble, click off of it. Instructions.split is not a function. How much more size instructions.split? Where's that? Where's it telling me that that's the problem? Uh, well, we don't want that to be the assemble. We want it to be document dot get element ID by ID code dot split, and that will work anyway at the minute. But it doesn't matter. So if our code equals not CLF push and or pop, then we want um, machine code equal to so we do want this but we want this dot machine code equals an array that is filled with 12 zeros okay that's cool and then we want to take this machine code here have that as an empty array or no it needs to be the same thing with 12 zeros and then what we're going to do is if valid opcode that includes opcode then we're going to say uh, machine code i equals opcodes to machine code fetch the opcode from this dictionary so basically we're going to use the opcode to get the corresponding machine code plus a load of zeros and then we're going to do console.log machine code right let's try that so let's do not clf push And in the middle of this, we're going to put a comment in. Mm. That's not great. I mean, I might do away with comments. But I'll add them for now. Uh, document get element by ID split is not a function. Yeah. Oh, it needs to be dot value. Gosh. How many times am I going to fail to have dot value tonight? Right, so. Nop. CLF. Comment. Push. Pop. Let's assemble that. Opcodes to machine code is not a function. You are right, that is not a function, that is a dictionary and it needs to be accessed as a dictionary. Well done. Let's try it again. Nop CLF comment push pop. Zero 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 one 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 zero 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 zero. So this is nice. Our first our first instruction is no op. We've gone we've got a CLF which is one 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 one, which as per what I showed you on the iPad earlier, no op is equal to one 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 one. And then our next one is 0, 0, 0, 0, so the comment becomes a no op. And then we've got 0, 0, 1, 1, which according to this is push. And then we've got 0, 1, 0, 0, which according to this is pop. Bam! So we've got the correct machine code 
written into each of these locations. Very nice. Very, very nice. Um, so, var has errors equals false. If if has errors equals false. If not has errors, <laughs> come on man. If not has errors, um, has errors equals true. Var error equals empty string. So if has error not has errors, then we want to say um, automatons selected automaton dot instructions equals document dot get element by id code dot value dot split at the new line automatons selected automaton dot machine code equals machine code and we're not doing anything with RAM and then finally we want to call load automaton selected automaton uh, automatons selected automaton is that gonna work so no op CLF comment push pop we assemble that cannot set property of undefined cannot set property of undefined automatons selected automaton obviously we can't set the property of undefined because we haven't selected the fucking automaton uh, I think that maybe I'll hide this window if you can't see the automaton so if we click off of this and click back on, that's still there. Hey. Um, however, it hasn't set the machine code. It, ha it has, we just haven't written the thing to write it out. So, var machine code equals empty automaton dot machine code dot length automaton machine code no we just want to do it in the same same thing not sure how I did that so machine code plus equals automaton dot machine code i backslash n and then we want to say document dot get element by id uh, or what's it called is it what's the name of that text area it is assembled it is it is assembled that's what that that's what that is Assembled equals machine code. Yeah, that makes sense. So, refresh this. Click on here. Um, no op. CLF. Comment. Push. Pop. If we now assemble this, please work. Oh, yes. There's our machine code. It works. I mean, it doesn't work for many things, but we actually have an assembler, and it really does. It it really does. Like it's going to give an error, right? If I put something in here um, that's not valid, then it's going to fail to assemble. Or, or not. Wait, 
why didn't it fail to assemble? Oh, because we didn't break this. Whoa, what do you want, Chrome? Oops, what's that? Alright, let's grab this. Let's refresh this. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, Luke. Um, it, it doesn't work great yet, but we're, we're getting there. Assemble. Yeah, now what's it telling me? Got separative and sign setting instructions. One day I'll remember to click it. And now if we do, oops. I try assemble that, what happens? Why did it assemble oops? else has errors equals true. Yeah. Error on line I plus one. Not a valid opcode. Not Oops. Just like this. Not. Oops. Assemble. And I'm guessing the error was not a valid opcode. Cool. So we're getting an error if the opcode isn't included in here. Okay, so once this is done, we want to continue. Um, otherwise, if opcode equals dat. then the operand is going to be equal to that. So we need to check if operand dot includes percent And we might as well do this as an. I know we're doing a continue there, but we're going to do this as well. Else if if operand dot includes percent. Else if operand dot includes hashtag. Right. Do we want memory locations to be accessible as deanery? So percent is binary. Hashtag is hex. Do we want to allow someone to enter deanery numbers? Yes or no? I, I will la allow chat to decide. And if neither of those are true and we can add a, a separate one for deanery, then we can say... Um, error equals error. Let's say var error line equals minus one. I'm going to say error line equals i i equals i error on line i plus one um, dot must be binary or hex. So we've got that going. Um, for learning, it's useful, but you will want people to move away from DNA and focus more on hex and binary, so it has pros and cons. I agree. I agree. 
Um, I'm kind of tending away from le saying let's not use binary. Uh, let's not use deanery, um, but I'd be happy to add it in future. But I'll, I'll say that for now. So if operand dot includes percent, maybe checkbox for getting an advanced units which allows and distills certain features like deanery. Yeah, that is a good idea, uh, which means I should include it, but it's not that hard to add it um, later down the line. And actually, I'm going to check that this is location zero equals that. Um, rather than it including it because you don't want it to be included somewhere else and it still allow the check to pass uh, then then we will say uh, machine code i equals this plus the data which is operand dot replace percent with In fact, Luke, how do I do a regex to make sure that the remaining, so let's say is operand zero. Uh, I like, I want to build a string out of this. If so I want to make I want to do like a regex and build a string and make sure that the rest of it is a binary string with exactly eight digits. Otherwise, it's not valid. So binary string equals empty string for var i equals one. I is less than operand dot length i plus plus binary string plus equals operand i and then I want to do a pattern match on that binary string and say if in fact I'm just going to google it regex for 8 bit binary That's not it. Okay, so uh, JavaScript pattern match. Thanks, Luke. Regular expressions, and then you do dot matches, right? So you do like, let's test it in here. So let's do um, reg expression that. dot matches is it new do I need the new expression how the fuck do I actually do regular expression matching oh it's dot test isn't it I'm thinking about uh, Kotlin False. False. Oh, Luke, you're such a boy, mate. So now we say if not dot matches binary string 
else. Plus binary string, otherwise we've got an error, so we're going to do... I mean, I should really make this error handling <laughs> tidier than this. Um, Error online thingy. Provided data must be 8-bit binary, e.g. year, or two-digit hex, e.g. year. Cool. I think that's pretty verbose error handling. I think that's enough. Um, and then we can even say here that... Um, opcode is not a valid opcode. Like that. Um... Okay, should we give that a go? I've got a feeling this isn't going to work out the gate, but I'm going to try it anyway. So that is going to be percent one one zero zero one zero one one. We need to select this first. So that percent one one zero zero one zero one zero. You've put matches again, not test. I'd have I'd have found it myself eventually. Test. Also, ooh, what's he what's he typing? Do you need regex that matches hex too? Uh, yeah, regex for hex would be cool. Although I've got a feeling that I know how to do that now, right? Because it would be for the hex, you'd just do. So you do this, right? And we'd have if hex string equals that, and then we'll take this. Uh, hex string equals operand i, and then if not regex equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, a, b, c, d, e, f. I think that's regex for uh, a hex string. And then here we need uh, hex to binary, which isn't a function I've written yet, hex string. Which actually that's going to be super easy to build. And then in here we'd have this, like this, again, our online provided day must be a bit binary or 2 digit hex. So it equals true. I think that's right. So I'm going to just very quickly check this regex. Hey, two D, A D, seven D, test seven D, seven G, false. Yeah, it does work. I'm a genius. I know regex. Come at me, easy peasy. Right, so we've got that. Um, I've got a feeling like the last thing I want to do is make this hex to binary string work, but we're going to test this first. So let's select this and let's say dot percent zero zero one one zero one one zero. Assemble that, and we end up with no. Why did that happen? Um, nice. Yes, it is nice. I'm happy with it. Machine code I equals opcodes to machine code opcode plus binary string. So let's do here, let's do console.log binary string. And what's happening there? Percent 00101100. I'm just going to start calling that function instead.
So like this, try that again. Symbol. 00101100. Is there another error? Somewhere else. So let's say console.log has errors. Oh, what the error is. Just for now, let's just do that. Select that, do that. Symbol. Ooh, what's going on there? What's going on? Regex is flags that can be set to ignore case or be strict and it might be worth either enforcing case in the entry or allowing upper and lower case and check the flag settings if it's not working. Cool. Um, I just think I'm just going to force up a case for now. Um, that's In my eyes, that's proper hex anyway. Um, and also the example has it uppercase, so tough shit. It's a good shout, um, but uh, I don't care right now. So, if not has errors, console.log machine code. And then let's also do here Agreed. Cool. So let's try this. Uh, that percent zero zero one 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 zero one one. Why is that not getting overwritten? happening between there and there that's stopping this from working. I can see the value is correct. That percent zero zero one one zero one 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 symbol. Yeah. Why why is the value not getting overwritten for machine code? What's wrong with this? Correct there. Oh, also, this is awful. The code's awful. I know, but I just want to. This is 100% just a uh, proof of concept that we can get this working. But why is that not working? Why? Why does that work? Well, this doesn't. I mean, what if I put something else in there? Instead, like... What if I did that? Does, it, does that work instead? What? So... Any idea what's going on here, boys? This line here is not working. For some reason, it's just not working at all. Of 
Come on, man. Stop. Percent zero one zero one zero one zero one. Any ideas, anyone? Why is it not allowing me to set a value to that? I is nine. Why is I nine? Oh, I'm an absolute dippy doofus we've already got I in this loop we've already got I in this loop and then I'm using it again J J J J J J J Yo, we put a loop in your loop so you can loop while you loop. There we go. Dot percent zero zero one one zero one one one. And if we run assemble, yes. There we are. So that inserts the data, and the opcode is no op. Set up assembler. Um, oh no. Before we do that, right. Last thing I'm going to do in the last couple of minutes is we're going to set up the hex to binary. Ooh, naked XYZ jerk off. Wet girls are here. Cool. Um, <laughs> I don't know why these people comment in my. Uh, comment in here. Um. That's always a sucker to spot. Yes, that was a sucker to spot. That was an absolute pain to spot, Luke. You are right, but we got there in the end. Uh, X string is that. Yada, yada, yada. Right, so now I'm going to do something a little bit... Just... Kind of pointless. Um... I mean, it's not really pointless, but we're going to create a constant hex to binary equals a dictionary. So we're going to do this all naively, and we're just going to say 0 maps to 4 bit 0, 1 match maps to 4 bit 1. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F. One, 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 zero, one, one, zero, one. I'm going to count up because it's easier. Zero, zero, one, zero. Zero one one, zero one zero zero, zero one zero one, zero one one zero, zero one one one, one zero zero zero, one zero zero one, one zero one zero, one zero one one, one one zero zero, one one zero one, one 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 zero, one 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 one. Cool. And then let's write a quick function called and hex string to binary hex uh, I think that's what I called it hex to binary so it doesn't really even need to be a function does it uh, it'd be hex to binary 
location hex string zero plus hex to binary hex string one. Right. Does that work? Dot percent uh, hashtag seven F. Dat hashtag dat hashtag seven F Assemble please seven zero one 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 F one 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 one. Let's just try a couple of these. So let's go with one one two E three D six six a A. Aaron line seven is not a valid opcode. Yes, you're right, it isn't. Uh zero 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 one zero 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 one is one one call two E is zero zero one zero two E is one 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 zero it's thirteen call three D is zero zero one one yep one one zero one is D yes six six is zero one one zero zero one one zero yes and AA is one zero one zero one zero one zero Boom There we go we have got an assembler that allows you to enter some stuff. Yes, it does. Cool. Right, let's just add one last thing, which is for empty uh, empty thingies. So if component if input input I equals empty string continue so that should allow us to have this nailed it we do have an assembler we do we've got an assembler it doesn't assemble everything yet but it is an assembler and it should now ignore now ignore empty lines yes and I can have as many empty lines as I want and it should ignore them all yes and it doesn't put them back in either it ignores empty lines so it actually deletes leading leaving empty lines but what if I put in here dot hashtag 2e would that work no why doesn't that work let's do continue there instead yes let's do continue there instead so we'll do dot hashtag 2f dot hashtag uh, 1e and when we try and assemble that it won't work because we've not selected our automaton so we'll do that do that assemble oh it actually gets rid of rid of white space so if I put white space in there it gets rid of it do we want that do we want to get rid of the white space I'm going to leave it as is for now. That's it. I'm considering that finished for what I want. So git add git commit dash m set up assembler for um, not slash dot push pop and clf clear flags. I'm going to push that. And there we go. We we have the makings of an assembler so what I'm going to quickly do is just a tiny bit of tidy up let's get the assemble button this 
we're going to put it back in here like that uh, and then we're going to actually take all of that no we're not, not like that we're going to take all of that and we're going to put it there does that look weird? sort of looks weird um, let's put it back in where it was in fact now let's move it to here and we're going to do overflow y hidden we're not going to have a height set we're going to copy this div and have this div again here. Like that. Div, div. I mean, what does that do? Oh, gosh. Right, scratch that. Let's just put them at the top. So let's do this, like that. And then, oh, no, not that. Sorry, we're going to grab that. And then we're going to put them there, inside the P like that and then we're going to say style equals position fixed top zero width 100% background color uh, green something like that but we want it When it absolute to a relative parent, got a HCSS, and then we want this fixed within that. Um, Class equals centered. Transform equals translate X. Okay, so we need just to translate in here then maybe. Position fixed, but translated. Is, is that what I actually want? I don't want width to be a hundred percent, definitely not. Uh, 
and then we're going to just set for this. That's cool. That's very cool. So now that just stays where you need it to be. I mean, this this is going to absolutely change um, plenty of times. Um, definitely plenty. Of, this is going to change a lot, but um, yeah. So that's ten o'clock. Um, I've said I'm a lot in the last few minutes. Apologies. So. I hope you have found that interesting. If you're watching this back, if anyone's watching this back at any point, thank you for watching it through. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I think at the minute it's just one viewer, and for most of the night I've only had one viewer. Um, so thank you to Luke for staying with me. This is an ongoing project. We want to build a programming game here. We want to build a game that teaches assembly programming and this is the starting building blocks of that. I know it doesn't look great. It doesn't need to look great. It needs to work great. That's the important thing. We will work on the looks further down the line, but for now we want to just get this actually working. So next time we're going to be building more of the assembler and then I might start actually building some of the game loops and the game logic. Remember I'm only building this in two and a half hour chunks, so it's probably going to take a while, but there we go, that's where we're up to. Uh, we've got the starts of an assembly getting built. So yeah, let's see Let's see where we go next. Thank you very much for watching, and yeah, I'll see you soon. Goodbye.